Grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God, our Father, and our Lord, and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. So today we're continuing our series on finding out who is this Jesus, and today we see that Jesus is greater. We travel to the top of a mountain. Jesus begins glowing. Moses and Elijah are there, and a very, very important message is sent to us about who we listen to and how we focus our lives. I'd like to illustrate this with uh, an image that I'm going to put up here on the screen. This, this, is, a, this is a beautiful picture, and you really don't even get, get the, the fullness of this picture um, right here on the screen. But as you can see, this is, this is an amazing picture. This is a picture called life. And... You can see all sorts of things in there, birds and trees and fish and all sorts of animals, sailboats, planets. I mean, it's, it's filled with every kind of thing. It's, it's the kind of picture that you could spend a lot of time just looking at. A lot of detail in that picture. Now, what if I told you that this was a puzzle? Ooh, the puzzle makers are, are saying that one would be fun. That would be, because you can imagine, I mean, there's some pretty tough spots in there, right? So the puzzle makers, all right, puzzle makers, let's see how you think about this one. This one has 24,000 pieces. That's right. 24,000 pieces. Can you imagine? Can you imagine? I'm just searching 24,000 pieces for two that go together. Yeah. So can you imagine how big this is? I have a picture. Take a look. It, it fits in the entire width of the wall of this room. Wow. 24,000 pieces. It's, it's like amazing. It's huge. Can you imagine the effort? The, the sheer frustration that must have gone into putting all of those pieces together. <coughs> Amazing, isn't it? I mean, it's, it's, it's actually, for some of us, I, I imagine it's just it's such an overwhelming thought. Can you imagine if someone gave that to you as a gift? <laughs> like, you're, you're there, you're looking at the box, 24,000 pieces, and you know when the, on the cover of these puzzle boxes, there's a picture. Like, you can see what it's supposed to look like. I mean, I know I would be tempted to take the box and put it on the wall. <laughs> there it is. That's what it's supposed to look like. I know it's supposed to be greater than that, but we'll settle for this. Well, it's, it's that kind of feeling, the, the idea of settling for something that's less, that we're going to be exploring today. And the story of the transfiguration. So let's let's get into the text here. Um, in, in Luke chapter 9. And so it starts off like this. Now about eight days after these sayings, uh, Jesus took with him Peter and John and James and went up to a mountain to pray. And um, and as we go through these these different things in the in the transfiguration, think of it kind of like a puzzle. So there's going to be a piece here, there's going to be a piece there, there's going to be a piece here. And they're all going to start coming together to form a picture. One of those pieces is right here. And you might not even recognize it. Eight days. Eight days. Why that detail? Why would Luke put in eight days? Well, it's actually kind of a signal to the early church. Because uh, the, the, the early church, they had this tremendous sense of the eternal. And God made everything in seven days. Did his creating in six, rest on seven. And even now to this day, we have a seven-day week. We go through seven days and we start over with one. And then we do it again and again and again and again. We get this rotation. And the early church looked at that and said, what about the eighth day? What about that day beyond? And so for the early church, the eighth day became a representation of the eternal. That day when Jesus comes back 
and there will be no seven day rotation anymore. It's just going to be eternity and it's going to be amazing. So I know that kind of is, it, it, it's, it's, a, it's a piece, all right? It's a piece of the puzzle, but it, it's a signal, a very clear signal to the early church to say, we're talking about eternity here. This is, this is talking about life after this life, when Jesus comes back. Let's gather some more pieces here. And as he was praying, the appearance of his face was altered, and his clothing became dazzling white. And behold, two men were talking with him, Moses and Elijah, who appeared in glory and spoke of his departure, which he was about to accomplish in Jerusalem. So Jesus gets up there, they're praying, and suddenly he's glowing white. And if you think about light and brightness, you go right back to the creation as well, right? The very first thing that God created was light. So what better to represent God in the flesh than light? Here he is. A light is emanating from this man who is God. And there he has some companions, Moses and Elijah. And these two represent the, the life and the hope of Israel. Moses represented the law. And, and the people of that day were crazy about the law. They were so crazy about the laws of Moses, they made more laws to make sure they kept the laws that Moses had. And then they made more laws to make sure they kept those laws. And there were so many laws, and they all wanted to be followers of Moses. And Elijah, Elijah was the greatest of the prophets, the one who defended Yahweh against all of these other false gods. And they had this sense that Elijah was coming. If you look at the, at the chapters before this in Luke, there are a number of places where the people are wondering, are you the Elijah to come? They would even leave a chair empty at their Passover meals, just in case Elijah showed up. That's how much they were looking forward to Elijah coming back. And so now there they are. Moses and Elijah. Jesus is glowing and they're chatting. They're talking. What are they talking about? They're talking about Jesus' departure. It's an interesting word, his departure. When you go to the Greek here and you look at the original language for the word departure... I think we get a much clearer vision of what they're talking about. The Greek word is exodus. Well, we know about exodus, right? That's the thing that Moses did, right? Moses led the, the people through an exodus out of the bondage in Egypt, through the desert and into the promised land. I think there is a very important parallel here. Jesus is going to go to Jerusalem and have an exodus. He's going to have the same kind of thing happen to him. Only he is going to die on a cross for our exodus in order to set us free from bondage to sin and death and the power of the devil. He's going to die on a cross, but it's going to set us free. And it's going to set us free to live and wander in this desert. Isn't the world in full, full of its sin kind of like a desert? And here we are. We know the truth. We've been given the forgiveness of all of our sins. And yet, ah, this place we have to be in. But we know at the end of this venture, there is a promised land. It's what I was describing about earlier, the eighth day. It's the day when Jesus comes back. It's the day when everything is perfect, reset back to its original state. That's what we have to look forward to. Jesus was going on an exodus, and we are coming along with him. Now Peter and those who were with him were had to asleep. But when they became fully awake, they saw his glory and the two men who stood with him. And as the men were parting from him, Peter said to Jesus, Master, it's good that we are here. Let us take three tents, one for you and one for Moses and one for Elijah, not knowing what he said. Ah, oh, I love Peter. Peter is so great. I just, he just, the words, they just, they just come out. Anything that's on the brain comes out of his mouth. And I, I just love it because we can relate to that. So here's Peter. He was asleep. He slept through the whole thing up to this point. He, he, he wakes up 
And there, standing before him, are his childhood Bible heroes. Think about it. He heard all about Moses. He heard all about Elijah. Can you imagine meeting them? Like, these are, like, his heroes. Like, it's just like, he doesn't know what to say. He's just like, that, that's Moses. No, I know, I know. Let's, tents. Let's do tents. And then you guys can all have a tent. And then James and John and me, we can come and visit. We can talk. This would be so cool. Okay. Kind of like that. So, but he's just kind of freaking out about it. Okay. And, and he doesn't know what's coming out of his mouth. Because it's just coming out. Right? And, and here, here's what's going on. He sees the glory. Right? He sees the picture. He sees Jesus glowing. He sees all of these amazing things happen. And you know what it's like? It's like putting the, the puzzle box on the wall. He says, this is good enough. I'll take this. It's beautiful. I can see the picture. And I can, I'll be content with putting the box on the wall. That's what he said, right? It's good that we're here. Right here, right now. The glory is now. This moment on a mountain. Let's see what happens next. And as he was saying these things, a cloud came and overshadowed them, and they were afraid as they entered the cloud. And a voice came out of the cloud saying, This is my son, my chosen one. Listen to him. And when the voice had spoken, Jesus was found alone. And they kept silent and told no one in those days anything of what they had seen. God had other plans. God is not content with hanging the puzzle box on the wall. There's a great, big, amazing picture that needs to be put together. And so this is how it goes. The cloud comes, and you can imagine, you know, you've ever flown uh, in an airplane into a cloud? Just like, poof. You can't see anything. And a voice comes. You can imagine how that felt. They were scared. I would be too. You know, this is my son. I've chosen him. I didn't choose Moses. I didn't choose Elijah. Jesus is the one who will bring about this exodus. Cloud clears away, and the only one left is Jesus. The voice said, listen to him. We're not listening to Moses anymore. We're not listening to Elijah anymore. We're going to listen to Jesus. Why? Because Jesus is greater. Jesus is the one who has come to bring about this exodus through his blood and an empty tomb. And so we listen to him. Now, this is a, bit, this is a little bit of a different picture, isn't it? Peter was looking at this and saying, I want the glory now. I've got it now. What does Jesus have to do in order to bring about this glory? He's, had, he's heading straight to a cross. He's going to suffer for this. There is no easy way to put this puzzle together. It doesn't just happen. Jesus needs to suffer in order for those pieces to come together. God is not content to put the box on the wall. He is wanting to see the suffering to happen so that we can have the redemption. And the picture is glorious. So what kinds of things is Jesus going to talk about that we listen to? It's going to be very similar to that. The, the, the few verses right before the transfiguration, here is what we need to listen to. And Jesus said to all, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. For what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses or forfeits himself? So Jesus is going ahead of us, and he's painting the beautiful picture. He's putting the beautiful picture together. He goes to a cross so that those pieces will fit together. And then, through the redemption that he gives to us, he puts us on the exact same path. And he says, you're going to live this beautiful life in the midst of a very ugly world. And it's not going to be easy. 
You're going to be given the forgiveness of all of your sins. And there are going to be people who hurt you. There are going to be people you love who won't love you back. There are people you, who you love who are going to hate you back. And guess what? You just keep loving them. Guess what? You keep holding on to that truth. And don't give in. Because if you want to save your life, you're going to lose it. But if you lose it for my sake, you'll find it. Take up your cross daily. So yes, there is struggle. But we keep our eyes on the prize, you see. Because he's greater. He's greater than the suffering. He's greater than the challenge. He's greater than any adversary that we would ever have. We keep our vision on the big prize. On the big picture. The one that we will inherit on that eighth day. The one that Jesus won for us upon the cross. And yes, there's challenge. And yes, there is struggle. Yes, it's difficult to love unlovable people. But that's what Jesus did for us. And the least we can do is do it for other people, right? Yes, it's difficult to hold on to truth. The world wants to define a different truth. We know what it is. God created it this way, and we will hold on to it now, and it will be beautiful the same way when Jesus comes back. We hold on to it, because we've got the big picture, because He is greater. Brothers and sisters in Christ, this is our calling. This is our calling. To follow Jesus in this way. To follow the one who on a mountaintop showed us his glory. To listen to him and follow him in his way. Because this Jesus is greater. Amen.